This is Duke University. We're in the home stretch here, and what we promised was we're going to pull it all together now. Uh, two stories uh, that, that essentially, as I was speaking to both speakers, are kind of like, oh, it's cool, all the different parts we talked about, I can see the little components in my story, if I can quote Jeff specifically. So first we're going to hear from Ben Brooks from Marsh, and um, that's all I'm going to say. Ben. Perfect. And I'm going to drive a little video here for whenever I'm queued to do that. Great, so uh, we're going to get into the Marsh U story, but uh, what I wanted to kick it off with was a uh, clip of my fabulous boss, Lori Ledford, who's our Chief Human Resources Officer. I mean, it's just really been remarkable and to see where we are now in terms of having launched, having people have profiles, having Oops. Our, our colleagues are teaching each other. So, and that was really the goal for us to introduce them to each other. So, sort of silly, but we have 25,000 people who work in over 100 countries all around the world, so they don't know each other. But getting them connected in a, in a very personal, direct way is starting to really happen, so it's really exciting, and Red Rover's made that possible. So that is an uh, a, a introduction from my boss about what we're up to at Marsh. So before we start, I know one thing when I'm at these sort of conferences, I always want to tweet about what's happening, but then I'm Googling everyone's name and things. So let me just have a little you know, audience empathy and give you the Twitter handles if you're looking for those. Um, so I'm up there, Marsh University, which is what we'll talk about. Uh, Red Rover is our technology partner, and they are a, uh, a, a startup company in uh, New York, a high growth company. Uh, this actually just participated in the Techstars program in New York. And then Marsh, which is my firm, uh, Marsh underscore Inc. And then additionally, our website for Marsh, the Marsh University platform, does have an external interface for you to explore at marshuniversity.com. So but we'll talk about Marsh, but I'll first tell you just a little bit about me. And uh, doing these uh, presentations, are, they're, they're a lot of fun, but they're a, a big challenge because it's like, what do I want to talk about? I think someone talked about social uh, data exhaust earlier today, and I feel like there's uh, so much to talk about, so many case studies, so many proof points. What are the most salient ones? At Marsh, I'm responsible for a lot of our strategic human capital initiatives. That includes social media and social learning internally at the firm. It also includes our workforce analytics, our engagement, our culture, and our values, and our human capital strategies globally. Now, Marsh is a world leader in risk and insurance services and solutions. We're a large global company, 100 countries, 25,000 employees, uh, 400 office locations, and we're you know, just about a $5 billion company last year, headquartered in New York, and we're a 140-year-old company. We're a financial services company. We're conservative uh, uh, in risk management, so naturally risk-averse about taking smart risks. So I think that we are um, a, a representative company of a, of a pretty typical company. So when we do this, I think it's one thing to hear about stories that are really of, of social media, a really bleeding edge, really, really progressive companies. Um, Marsh is more towards the middle of the pack in that regard in terms of corporate culture and infrastructure. So um, we're also a member of the Marsh and McLennan com family of companies, which also includes Oliver Wyman, Guy Carpenter, and Mercer, our sister companies, uh, which are very uh, established in their space. So what I want to talk about is what is Marsh University. Marsh University, let me tell you, don't get fooled by the name. It is not a traditional corporate university. But what is it? Well, Marsh University is about knowledge sharing. It is about relationship development, capability awareness, skills expansion, collaboration, and you know what? Fun. Because we really do, as people talked about earlier today, want to acknowledge the humanity at work. And so this isn't meant to be just purely frivolous, but you can actually manage workflow and learn and develop and collaborate and have fun simultaneously. They're certainly not mutually exclusive. So what I want to start with is a declaration. So a lot of people, when they talk about social media or enterprise 2.0 or collaboration, get into a technology conversation really soon. And that, I, technology is great. We all like technology. But we actually start with a declaration. And if you think about a declaration, like a declaration like in the United States we declared independence, we didn't have independence. We declared it and we had to go fight a war to win that, right? So a declaration is actually putting some stakes in the ground um, rather than rolling out a technology platform and seeing what works. So to give you a little history about Marsh, in the 2000s, uh, some might even call it the dark years for our company. So we're a celebrated company, very uh, preeminent in our space. 9-11, we had a tragic loss of life, life almost 300 colleagues. 
one of the highest losses of any company. Uh, and that started a pretty dark decade for us as a firm. Uh, we had some, uh, we had been uh, fined by the Attorney General of the State of New York, and we had had lost significant revenues, and had to lay off thousands of employees, unfortunately, uh, that were very loyal to the firm. Additionally, we had uh, numerous management changes and really rigorous expense management, and then the Great Recession. Uh, so that, that rounded out a pretty uh, tough decade for Marsh. So now we come along, and as, as we're hopefully coming out of the recession, and the imperative, like many firms, is to grow the company, uh, it requires different things of our people as we evolve our business strategies. So, you know, to set some context, it's, it, we're not rolling off of a really huge, you know, growth, you know, wave in the 2000s. Um, we really kind of uh, got our business back in fighting shape and, uh, through restructuring. So that's where we started from. So, you know, we, in our, our, our previous CEO, Dan Glazer, talked about various acts, and uh, Act 1 was about the restructuring. It was about accountability and P&L clarity and real back-to-basics, expense management, uh, things that are probably very common at a lot of other firms the last couple of years as well. And so that was what we, what we had. We also had some cultural things that we were addressing as well about, um, you know, instead of problem avoidance, kind of running to the problem and more transparency uh, and more accountability in that regard. As we transitioned into what we called Act Two, it was much more around growing the firm. It was about taking smart risk and collaborating. And you see in the, the lower right-hand corner there, it looks like a little parchment paper like the Declaration of Independence. That's actually where the Declaration from Marsh University came to be. It was a part of the commitment and the, the possibility that was created to create Marsh being a great place to work for outstanding people. And what one of the commitments that executive management uh, made to that was to create a Marsh University. And what that meant, we weren't really sure, but we knew we didn't have $50 million to go to upstate New York and do a traditional brick and mortar facility, because that wasn't going to be sustainable environmentally, cost-wise, or over the long term. So that's where the declaration came through. And we are just in the same process concurrently rolling out Ignite, which are our, our, our revised operating principles and kind of the definition of the culture at the firm. So you can see those there. So Ignite is, again, another uh, project that we've been really focused on embedding that in all areas and aspects of our business. And we needed to look at what could Marsh U do based upon colleague engagement feedback, a bunch of analysis we did with our HRIS data that said we had big gaps around information sharing, around colleague development and career management uh, and, and partnering across bi the business. And so Ignite also, since that aligns our values and our behaviors, things about being in touch or being inclusive, right? That, you know, having much more transparency in a lot of ways uh, or really being engaged. We say actively participate and making Marsh extraordinary. Well, that was a great aim, but we kind of had to create an environment where people could do that. Much like a lab can create innovation, you have to have that space or that clearing for that to be created in. So just to give you some, I want to give you a lot of context. Really, really rough 10 years of a celebrated company that's been pr uh, dominant in its space, and then a big cultural change after a whole lot of other kind of rigorous changes. So our, we made a declaration. But then next, it's a demonstration. So when I talk about a demonstration, what we did is rather than a traditional kind of IT big bang with lots of requirements definition for a couple years and then building something and you hopefully got it right and then rolling it out and praying people use it, uh, we did it a little bit differently. And we thought much more with a uh, marketing mindset and from the change management almost looking at our colleagues as customers. Like what would they be willing to invest their discretionary time or even potentially their money in? And uh, actually eventually we got some feedback from a few business leaders that said if you're ever short on money, will help pay for your, your platform. So that's how we knew we were kind of on the right track. But really, when you think about a demonstration, you're going to have to deal with change management. And so we've all heard so much about change management in the last couple of years in particular. And there are very, very heady, complex, elegant definitions and things. I'm going to give you some really simple thoughts about how we think about change management, because I think uh, simplicity actually supports the change. So when you think about change management, People are in a variety of different places, and they were at, our, at Marsh, and they probably are in your organization as well. And that's okay. It's okay for people to be across that spectrum. But if you think about things like ignorance, rejection, acceptance, and use, and you think about technologies that today seem pretty commonplace, like the cell phone, I, I would be hard pressed to believe that anyone in this room or that's watching online today uh, hasn't touched a cell phone in the last 24 hours. It's just become a pretty standard object. We talked to, you know, wallet, cell phone, and keys, maybe all becoming one, one device as a prediction for 2015. But, you know, the, the cell phone has just become ubiquitous. And, you know, but, but 10 years ago, it might have not been that way. So these all we can understand why, why they're in that place. But not everyone's kind of completely aligned. Let's say instant messenger. You might have communicator, same time, et cetera, at your firm, or even Skype. 
um, maybe you still are seeing kind of a difference in adoption there. Now when you think of more kind of emergent technologies, people might fall on a different part on the change management there. So this is kind of my very scientific uh, plotting of where people might be, uh, representative at least at Marsh. And so, you know, that's it's okay, but you have to realize people are in these different places. Now, nanobots, if I told you what those were, it'd probably just piss you off. So, um, let's do talk about change. And change, my mom, I'm going to talk about my, mo my mom for a second. So speaking of cell phones, she used to use her cell phone like a flare in her car. It was in her glove box for a real oh shucks moment, you know. So I couldn't call her or text her, it didn't ever have a charge, but it was just there in case of a real emergency. And so, you know, my, you know I'd kind of always had this view that my mom wasn't a big technology user. Well, then comes along uh, the iPhone. So we get my mom an iPhone and things change. In fact, this is my mom now pretty much likes to text me only in emoticons. So I actually, this is a real text message from her that actually says, mom and dad are getting coffee and breakfast at the airport. It's a great day to fly. See you tonight for drinks and dinner. That's a real text message from my mom. <laughs> you can ask her. So, and she's my Facebook friend and she's all over there. But you know, what I think you need to realize is have high expectations for your people. I think so often we will just, you know, our people won't use it or that'll never work here. You'll hear a lot of those sorts of things. If you create a compelling enough interface, which the, the very, very capable team at Apple has with the iPhone, uh, you know, many of our, our parents and grandparents and, and people that you wouldn't expect to be big technology users are using Apple and other innovative products because they're so easy to use and they actually solve a real problem. So just, you know, have high expectations of your people and know that they do change. Now, our strategy at Marsh, you know, a lot of organizations, when you look at learning and development, knowledge management, et cetera, spend a lot of money going outside the firm. And they look for answers and information and content and frameworks and tools and models. <laughs> and they pay a lot of money to external firms. So that's really great if you're a consultancy. Uh, not so great if you're a company like Marsh, which is trying to manage an expense base. And we have so many loyal, talented colleagues that are really known as the thought leaders in our industry. They're really respected in our space as kind of being number one. And so how we thought, you know, if you really think of this, this bridge here, the Golden Gate in San Francisco, you see this fog. And if you've been to San Francisco, you know about that fog in the morning if you ever try to fly into SFO. And so what we needed to do as an organization is really burn off the fog. So what you see here is the bridge. You don't see a world-class city below it. And that was a little like how we saw with our organization. So we needed to create what I call a metal detector for organizational gems. So what are those gems? Their connections, their experiences, their knowledge, their assets, their uh, command media, et cetera. How did we kind of you know, uncover and unlift the best of Marsh and bring it there? Because I'll tell you what, most of many companies' assets are in one of two places, in people's brains, on their gray matter, or on their hard drives. So not exactly very institutionalized and certainly not very searchable or available. So huge strategic organizational impact as well. And part of also burning off the fog is what, you know, if you think about colleague engagement, engagement's great. And if you look at it very simply and say engagement is discretionary effort above and beyond and meets requirements on a job, that's great. But if you create that additional capacity, you have to capture it. So you think about, you know, you know, a carbon sink and you think in environmental science, you know, kind of something to pull that carbon in. You want to create an engagement sink. How do you capture that discretionary effort so it doesn't turn into a bake sale or a water cooler conversation or someone just spending more time doing email? How do you capture it in something that accelerates the business along its defined strategy? So that was directionally our thoughts about what to do with the platform. But we actually, you know what? We didn't start with technology. I mean, we started with a light petition, but we actually didn't launch a site. We launched a petition and there was a lot of buzz about this Marsh University thing was coming and what is Marsh U and people had very literal expectations around curricula and syllabus and a lot of things you would see at a, at a great school like Duke, but that wasn't necessarily our plan. And so what we had to do is reframe expectations and get excitement around what we were going to do with Marsh U. So we actually launched with a petition, a 60 second video that talked about Marsh U and reframed it in a very different way. And we said at Marsh, everyone's a teacher. What will you teach? So it completely flipped it. People were expecting to be students, kind of mama bird chews up the, you know, the worm in baby bird's mouth. No. The number one retention for learning is through teaching. When people teach, they learn, they retain information. I mean, like far and away any other methodology. And so, so we wanted everyone to be a teacher and have that, you know, to acknowledge that each one of our colleagues at any level of the organization, I'm not just talking managing directors with 25 years of experience in one of the major urban markets. I'm talking anyone in the firm has knowledge that could be very useful. And it could be solving a super tactical problem, but if it's solved, 
could cre create great efficiency. And so that's what we started with. And so we actually had you know, uh, 7x the response rate that we anticipated. Now another little tip as you're doing this, measure. Because business leaders take things seriously, they get measured. Oftentimes in HR and internal communications and things, they're not measured. So we used campaign management software, MailChimp, and we measured email click rates and open rates. That's something we do with our clients. We don't typically do that internally. We did that internally, and so we could set expectations about what good open rates look like and do the A-B testing on the, the, uh, the, the subject line and those sorts of things. So we started, there was a big change management thing, not only with our colleagues using Marshu, but also with our executives getting comfortable in defining what success is. You know, we have 25,000 colleagues. So some could say, well, we don't have 25,000 people blogging you know, in the second week. It's not a success. Well, if you look at you know, the 99-1 rule of online communities or other different frameworks like that, that we had to really educate them. And having the, the data uh, and, and displaying it in a way that was understandable with insights really helped. And I'll talk more about that. We also had to make it fun. So we use uh, uh, Red Rover, and then we use WordPress to ho host our blogs. And with that, we, the, we had a standard template and format that includes a photo that anchors the, a blog. And people love the photos. We try to curate ones that really capture the essence of the blog. So our CEO, our new CEO, Peter Zafino, blogged on his second day at the company. And so we actually had a, a seed kind of sprouting out of soil, just germinating. And we thought it captured perfectly the essence of that moment of him communicating. And we do that for each one of the blogs. We have a team that helps manage that. But we were using stock images, and they're really pretty. But we thought, again, bur let's burn off the fog. Had a photo contest, and we had, I think, what do I put here? 700 photos submitted, 30,000 votes. And that was one of the first things we did. And you wouldn't think with knowledge sharing or relationship development, you'd go to photos. But that created a sticky and compelling experience where people got to contribute in a light way. And we had people that, you know, people that won were in Peru and in Turkey and Colombia and places like that that uh, are not, say, our largest countries, but we had very engaged people uh, that got recognition, and then we got something out of it. It was actually cost effective. The cost of the flip cameras was less than what we were paying for stock images, so we actually saved money in the process. Um, so here is some secret sauce, ambassadors. So just like countries have ambassadors around the world, uh, we did as well. And what we mean by ambassadors are people that, you know, in addition to their day job, take on making the platform work in their geography, in their culture. You know, with a company as large as ours and the kind of acquisitions we've made, we have a very broad set of capabilities across the insurance value chain. But in different markets, how it looks in Germany might look different even than France, but certainly very different than, than a, a more emerging market like mainland China. And so what we've done is we've identified ambassadors, and this has been kind of all attitudinal. We didn't say we have to have one in every country. We looked where there was energy, and that's been a big theme, go where there's energy. And so we just, it was all attitudinal filtering. And so people in particular, we had a bias for folks that were in the business, that were client facing, that would take this on. And I'll tell you what, a great example, I was in the United Kingdom in May, and we were doing a, an event, a photo drive there to get photos on profiles. And so tea and cakes works really well in London. The same day, they were having an event with an ambassador in Mexico, and it was all about giving out backpacks. So the Mexicans would have thought, tea and cakes, this is crazy. And the, peop the Brits thought, backpacks, what? But that's what worked in each geography. So you had to have the flexibility and to do the kinds of things that will bring people in that's relevant in that geography and to solve the problems. And so it might be that in one geography, it's all about getting people aligned around a new value proposition and employee benefits. Another geography, it's actually integrating an acquisition you made and getting people to know each other. And so we have a platform flexible enough that allows us and our business leaders and colleagues to do that. So again, a picture of some of our ambassadors around the world. Again, vast majority of them are in the business. Uh, and you know, we give them a title, and we give them lots of data, and we give them lots of support, and they give us lots of feedback. And so it's, it's definitely a both win relationship. Again, measurement, also set competitions. You know, we look at ourselves, we, do, you know, we have geographic uh, P&L structure, and so we look at ourselves that way. So we started for profile adoption, I mean, which is just the, the, you know, the entry point with a lot of the social here. We divided it by countries, and we started sharing this with the senior executives. Well, guess what? If you're an executive, I mean, Latin America, right now, you see 84% of our colleagues, and that's growing like every day. Four months ago, they were at 8%. So the, the leaders in Latin America were like, uh-uh, that's not going to be us. We are not going to be in last place. And they've, they've literally gone from worst to first. But that's all been around what the community managers and the, the ambassadors have done and the business <coughs> leaders to make it work in Latin America. They've done things that are very different that have become a model for actually the rest of the world. 
Uh, but again, it's the whole notion of keep score. Simple measures, but keep score. So we've got you know, almost 15,000 colleagues out of our 25 that in a, in a year's time of volu- less than 10 months time have voluntarily come to the platform. Again, no, none of the balanced scorecard requirements, because I strongly believe anytime you make something required, it taps into that part of your brain where your taxes are, and it's a big buzzkill. So we definitely try not to make things required because uh, we should make it compelling enough that people want to do it, uh, and, and that creates a much a uh, higher bar for the kind of interface you do, the kind of change management, the kind of customer service you do with your colleagues, but I think it makes it a lot more fun at the same time. Again, speaking of data, you know, it's important to look at how different demographics of your workforce use the platform and what their perceptions are. So we measure this, th- the problem, with lo- actually there's, there's so much data, it's not for a lack of data, which in, often in a lot of business problems there's a lack of data. We have a ton of data, so it's how can we sift through it and make it meaningful. So one thing we measure is in our colleague engagement surveys and in our quarterly pulse surveys, we actually measure colleague perception of value. Marsh University is valuable to me on a Likert scale, five points. And so that's the ultimate thing. I mean, we could sing a great story to management about how great Marsh U is and create really compelling slides, but if colleagues don't value it and don't see it solving real problems for them and it's an integral part of their experience, who cares? Because that's the whole reason. It's really about the, the, the whole pyramid, not just the top of the pyramid. So this is all about multilateral communication, not just a traditional top-down like you would see in an intranet. Now and here, you know, we, we look at um, years of service, for instance. There's a lot of perception that say, oh my gosh, this is only for the 23 and 24-year-olds, the, the Facebook generation, uh, the folks that you know, text message their parents in the next room and this sort of thing. Well, you know, we looked at you know, degrees of engagement. You know, they have a profile, are they commenting, and have they blogged? And then disaggregated it by years of service bands uh, is, a, is a relative proxy for generations or age and really saw, on the whole, pretty, pretty proportional across the board. Um, you saw in comment, commenters there, uh, for our colleagues that are 10 to 20 years of service, were actually underweight. And this is as of September. So we actually were able to do targeted campaigns to those particular users, because we have the demographics, and push campaigns, and also do some focus groups and some interviews to understand what wasn't working for them. And that's now back in, at a proportional scale. Client-facing versus non-client-facing. Oh, this is really great for people in the office all day, but I've got clients to deal with, and people that have clients to deal with would never use this. Well, we're actually finding that's not the case at all. The people that are client-facing have a ton of knowledge to share. They would love to be recognized for it. They've got great sales stories. The things that we do for clients and how we help them is just remarkable. And they want a platform. They want to get that out there. And so they're very engaged, and we see that they're proportionally very engaged uh, across those boundaries as well. In terms of how we're doing, Innovation Week actually gave us their Innovation 500 award, so for one of the most innovative uses of business technology, which we were pretty excited about, uh, given the fact that our colleague tools are typically, you know, decent, but they're typically not Innovation Week worthy, award-winning worthy, easy for me to say. Um, But, you know, we have over 1,000 blogs, and we've got almost 15,000 colleagues on profiles, and we're about a third of a million visits here, and again, we've just been operational for about a year's time. And then uh, uh, Techstars featured uh, Red Rover, our technology partner, uh, in a Bloomberg reality TV show documentary. So they came and filmed this one day. Uh, And so we've we've had a lot of fun with it as well. So that's a a, a summation of a lot of the demonstration of what we've done. And again, it it is many small victories. There's not a lot of uh, big bangs that we've had. It's been many little proof points along the way. Um, I can tell you three in the last day, and I love that they happen. Like, I've been on the road for about a week now, and they happen, and I just see them in email, and things are emerging. But we have leaders taking it on themselves as they tour the world carrying flip cams around and filming meetings and sharing and introducing the claims team in New Zealand to the rest of the world. And we, we have those sorts of things that are really that are popping up. We actually had our senior executive team very frustrated around some of the financial acumen of some of our colleagues. And so they actually developed their own course, if you will, having senior leaders all blog on financial acumen and promoted that. And then they became huge promoters of the site because it was solving a problem that they had. And so in terms of what's next, going from declaration to demonstration to domination, uh, as I like to think about it because it just sounds fun, um, we we have uh, a whole host of new functionality. And again, rather than you know, drop a bag of tools or a Home Depot on top of our employees, which I think is actually pretty dangerous, uh, we've been using a much more agile approach and delivering new functionality as people get comfortable rather than have it be this huge pill to swallow. Uh, we break it up for folks and really have them pull for it. 
So things like micro-sharing, which we call Spark, Spark an idea, Spark a question, Spark a discussion, or things like groups. We actually have people pulling for now and demanding and hungry for it, which is so much better than trying to force some new sort of shiny object at people. So these are all things that are coming out here that have come out, actually we did our, our intranet uh, article yesterday about the, the Spark launch that we had and we were seeing colleagues around the world use that. Another pretty exciting thing is um, on Friday I head off to London with a, uh, a number of our team. Our senior leadership has a strategy meeting every year get together about 180 of our senior leaders and the last couple years we've made big strides to share what happens in that meeting through a cascade that happens over a couple month period of time and there's a video and standard slides. Uh, this year we're really going to turn that on its head and be really inclusive and very in touch, two of our Ignite operating principles, by sharing the meeting essentially live with all colleagues. So this is unprecedented transparency for our company and we have a new CEO and we've made a, a number of different organizational changes and new investments and acquisitions so it's a perfect time to bring everyone along and so we'll literally be sharing the live and not just live streaming but essentially live tweeting through Spark we're gonna do just like on reality TV shows you know when people get into a fight and then they pan to you know Jerry in a box talking to the camera we'll have Jerry in a box and we'll be doing videos and all sorts of things that way and actually using the platform to even solicit questions amongst audience participants at the meeting <laughs> for the CEO to answer on the final day. So it'll be a, a whole different level of inclusion and real-time action. Additionally, we've been, in, and Marsh O'Connor you heard for has, has been a great partner of ours at Marsh, uh, someone I met on Twitter, uh, my first Twitter person that I met in person and it was uh, love at first sight. But she's been great with us at, at uh, Marsh, and she likes working at Marsh just because Marsha and Marsh sound pretty similar. So, um, so we sometimes joke it's Marsha University. But, uh, but uh, we, we created the blogger, certified blogger program, which was in beta test right now. We're going to launch this in December. And it was really to, to address the notion of, you know, we want to let people blog directly on the site. Right now, we make it easy. There's, we have colleagues, if they want to blog or send a video or whatever, we s there's a team of folks that, that work for me that help upload that. So we did that kind of explicitly because it's really easy. So I, we always say, if you can email, you can blog. Kind of implicitly, we did it also because legal and compliance rightly had some legitimate concerns about content, whether it's inappropriateness or confidentiality, et cetera. And so we said, we'll vet that and kind of have a once over on it. So what we're trying to do is, in, in the mantra, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, we're teaching people the right way to blog. It's going to be a pretty innovative, action-led program through Marshall C. Blogger, this avatar, that will lead colleagues on a course that incorporates our code of conduct, our marketing guidelines and things, but in a very compelling and fun way, colleagues will create their own portfolio of blogs that they'll get feedback on as a part of the course, and then get a licensed driver or good housekeeping seal of approval, a badge, gamification buzzword, um, on their profile when they complete that and they'll be able to blog directly to the site. What we also think we'll have an appreciable difference in their written communication and persuasion skills that has impact on Salesforce effectiveness, RFP performance, et cetera. So that's something else coming out. A couple other things that we have on the horizon. Uh, we, we, have a, we can log on from any computer in the world, which is great, but when we're on the Marsh network, we're going to have it authenticate in through a true ESSO, uh, which will, again, Adoption is all about the colleague is here, you want them to do this here, how do you take barriers out of the way? Signing in is a barrier, we're going to take that one out. Another thing, making it mobile, how do we have that be so it's very easy to interact? We do kind of light mobile now through email uh, integration, a majority of our colleagues have a Blackberry and so they get notified of comments, you can do reply by email commenting and it's your Sparks as well, but we'll actually have an app or, or a web interface as well. And then, you know, Marsh Space is another colleague collaboration portal we have, and inside Marsh is our intranet. We're working on a project right now where where can we take the best of all three of these platforms and integrate it in one unified experience that's in the workflow, like we heard about earlier today, that's compelling and sticky, but that meets a lot of different objectives. We kind of think of it as a hub for spokes. So that is where we're looking from going. Is in this, here's, here's the end, but that's where we're looking. We started with the declaration then a demonstration, and then it's now, right now, it's all about domination. So, thanks for your time, and Thank I'll you hand it back to Tony. Wow. That was fantastic. Great. As someone who worked in corporate learning, I tweeted that uh, I, I don't think it's Marsh U, I think you've created uh, a learning ecosystem that really taps in, and I love the, 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 blog, the blogger gamification mm -hmm. idea of kind of bringing that capability in. So it's like the strange attractor that keeps everybody in a community of learning. That's Absolutely. fantastic. Thank you. Told you. Told you. Now, is it Marsha you? <laughs> Marsha's going red back there.
produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.